time as well. You know, we all know some famous trilogies. Perhaps the most famous trilogy would be J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. But there's also C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. Those of you that like movies, you remember when Star Wars was a trilogy? I don't know how many it is now, but it started out as a trilogy. Um, uh, uh, the Godfather Trilogy, Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games, for some of you younger folks. We could go on and on. But this morning, we look at a psalm that is the third in a trilogy of psalms. Psalm 22, 23, and 24 is a trilogy which gives us prophetically the work of Jesus Christ. Psalm 22, which we looked at a couple years ago, presents the Lamb of God who gives his life for sinners. Psalm 23, as you know, depicts the good shepherd in his resurrection glory leading his sheep through the wilderness of this life and into our rest. And then our psalm this morning, Psalm 24, portrays King Jesus in all his exalted, glorious, reigning might. So we turn our eyes to Jesus in Psalm 24 this morning. G. Campbell Morgan, famous preacher from yesteryear, connected these three psalms this way. He said, by our calendars yesterday, he, Jesus, passed through Psalm 22. Today, he is exercising the office of Psalm 23. Tomorrow, he will exercise finally the authority of Psalm 24. And in Psalm 24, another Psalm of David, he asks a very important question, one of a, a question that every one of us will eventually face. And the question is this, who can stand before a holy and mighty God? And in these verses, David not only asks the question, he gives us the answer as well. Read with me, if you will, Psalm 24 in its entirety, and then we will look quickly at it. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You know, it's thought that this psalm was written by David to commemorate the event that's recorded in, in 1 Chronicles 13, 2 Samuel 6. You remember David, after he's anointed king, eventually he defeats the Philistines. He captures the city of Jerusalem. And then he celebrates God's victory by bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And it's thought this psalm was written for that occasion. The Ark, as you know, was a testimony of God's presence with his people. And Jerusalem, or Zion, became known as the dwelling place of God. But the Ark and the tabernacle and then the temple with the sacrifices, the celebrations, the festivals, this was always pointing to something greater. It gave God's people a glimpse of what God would one day do through Jesus on the cross. And so here in Psalm 24, we have a very early presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a clear picture of Jesus being sung of as Israel rejoiced that God was in their midst. And David begins this psalm with the fundamental truth, one that was mentioned in the Sunday school class this morning, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? God owns this earth. He says, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. He is everywhere. The world and those who dwell in it, it is all his. He owns it. He designed it. He engineered it. He sustains it. He is present in it, and he is sovereign over it. The whole earth belongs to God, and not just the earth, but all it contains as well. 
It's mind-boggling. Once again, whenever we talk about God, it is mind-boggling. He, he owns not just the water and the land and the air and the animals and the plants and the birds and the everything. He is also owns and is sovereign over every man, woman, and child. We are not the accidental product of an impersonal universe. We're, we're not subject to blind chance and random forces without purpose or meaning, no. That this earth is the Lord's and all it contains has huge implications that, that shapes our worldview, that, that shapes our worship of our God. There is not a single nation, not a single people group, not a single place in this universe that does not belong to God. There's not a single moment of the day that isn't his. You know, he is Lord not just on Sundays, right? You know that, right? Monday through Saturday as well. He, he's worthy of our worship and our praise, not just when we're gathered together like this as the church, but when we're at home, when we're at school, when we're at work, when we're in our neighborhoods, in our stores, restaurants, in every place. The world and those who dwell in it are his. And in verse 2, David tells us why this is so. He says, it's all his because he is the creator of all things. And we're not told how God founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers, but we're told, or we're clearly told that he created it and he owns it because he is its creator. He is sovereign over it because he made it. This God made us. This God made all things. This God watches over his creation. He is present in it. Nothing is hidden from him. This is the God to whom we all must one day give an account. And so in verse 3, David asked the question, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Well, the hill of the Lord is a, a reference to Mount Zion or Jerusalem where God symbolically dwelled above the Ark of the Covenant. Who may ascend? Who may approach this God? He asks it a second way. Who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who is spiritually qualified to have fellowship with this God? Who can approach him? Who can draw near to such a holy and mighty sovereign and stand in his presence in his holy? You know, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Who can approach this awesome, holy, and mighty God? And once again, you know, David's asking this question in the context of the Old Testament covenant, the Levitical priesthood, who, who would serve in the presence of God in the tabernacle and in the temple. But it's a question we all must ask and answer. And, and so David asks, who can approach this God? And, and then he gives the answer. And he gives four qualifications there in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. That is the person that can stand before our holy God. You know, the answer that David gives here is a, a shortened version of the answer he gives in Psalm 15 where he says, O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? In other words, who can stand in your presence? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. And so here in Psalm 24, David gives just four qualifications of those who can approach God. What does he say? First, they have to have clean hands. You know, we all lived through COVID. We washed our hands a lot. We have clean hands. We can approach God, right? Is that what he's saying? No. Uh, clean hands uh, demands outward purity, if you will. Purity in our activities, in our actions, what we do. If we're to approach God, everything we do must be perfectly clean. We must have a pure heart, he says, secondly. Demands the inner purity. Purity in our thoughts and our motives. Everything we think, every reason we have for doing whatever it is we do, it all has to be pure. It's to have a soul that is holy and undefiled, set apart for God without any moral defilement. 
And, and so David starts off both the inner life, a person's character, and his outer life, his conduct are represented and have to be clean and pure. He goes on and says, has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. Uh, it's debated what this phrase means. It possibly refers to idols. You know, idols are lifeless and false. An idol is, is anyone or anything that, that a person loves, fears, or serves more than God himself. And so what I think David is saying here is he's demanding purity in our devotion to God alone. We're to have a heart and a life committed to seeking and serving only the true God at all times. And the only way we can avoid pursuing what is false is by pursuing God and his glory. As we read in Exodus, the Ten Commandments, we must have no other gods, right? We must have a love for and a loyalty to the one true God. And the fourth qualification David gives has not sworn deceitfully. Demands purity in our speech. Demands we don't speak lies, that we aren't deceitful in what we say, but always speak the truth. And so each one of these four things he lists are all marks of holiness. Which the writer of Hebrews says, without which no one will see the Lord. No one will be able to stand in his presence. No one will be able to ascend on his hill. Having clean hands, a pure heart, forsaking what is false for the pursuit of God, speaking the truth in love are all commanded by God, and we were created for them. So here's the question. How many of us can claim that we have clean hands, pure heart, don't follow falsehood, serve and trust God only, and have never lied or been deceitful? None of us. You know, some people come to the wrong conclusion when they read passages such as this and, and they water it down in its meaning. They recast it into something that they think they can achieve on their own. They, they, they pretend they're better than they really are. They overlook their own faults. They, you know, they'll say that, you know, God doesn't really mean perfection here. No, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Therefore, look at all the good things I do. Surely that outweighs the bad. I can stand before a holy God. No, you can't. Verse 4, clean hands, pure heart, a life that doesn't pursue what is false, lips that don't speak only truth. These are God's high and holy standards for those who would draw near to him. So once again, who can meet those qualifications? Can you? I don't want to burst your bubble, but no, you cannot. None of us can. Who of us can say that all we think is pure? Always. That our every motivation is right. That we haven't lifted up our souls to falsehood or worship some idol. That God and his glory are first in all things, in our thoughts, in our lives. We've always spoken the truth. We've never sworn deceitfully. That does not describe us, does it? You know, we saw a couple weeks ago in Psalm 14 where it says, The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. What's his conclusion? They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. If that is true of all of us, and it is, and if we're left to ourselves to meet these requirements to be able to come before a holy God, we can only despair. Uh, we failed miserably at, at every one of these qualifications. Uh, there's a clear impossibility to these requirements. We are condemned in our sinfulness. Were we to stand before God in judgment outside the gracious provision of Jesus, we would see written against us a multitude of sins, many of which we're not even aware. As Paul said, the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which were hostile to us, they would overwhelm us. If this psalm ended here, we would be without hope. We would have no way to stand before our holy God. Our just end would be condemnation because what? The wages of sin is death. And yes, we should all strive to have clean hands, a pure heart. But the Bible also tells us that none of us meets that requirement in and of ourselves. So how are we supposed to ascend the hill of the Lord? How are we to stand in his holy place? Oh, only the completely righteous can do that. Once again, remember this psalm may have been written 
for when the ark was brought into Jerusalem. Do you remember that story when, when David moved the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned above the cherubim? You remember they started out, a man by the name of Uzzah did what? The ark began to rock a little bit, and he put his hand on it. His death reminds us that none are righteous. The ark represented God's presence on earth. Do you think you could have laid hold of the ark and lived? No. Can you ascend the hill of the Lord? Can you stand in his holy place? Do you have clean hands? Do you have a pure heart? Not apart from Jesus, you don't. Only Jesus can ascend the hill of the Lord. Only Jesus can stand in God's holy place. Only Jesus has perfectly clean hands and a pure heart. Only Jesus is perfectly righteous, completely without sin. Only Jesus could lay hold of the ark and not die. You know, I'm very thankful the psalm does not end here. Because David moves on to the provisions that God has made for us, beginning in verse 5 where he says, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That is a loaded verse right there. It's an Old Testament expression of justification by faith in Christ alone. We often get these things backwards. A holy life is not the cause of our justification before God. I should say our holy life is not the cause of our justification before God. We receive justification. We receive vindication. We receive eternal life as a free gift from God by virtue of his grace. It's something he provides so that we can approach him in a way he finds acceptable. And there's only one man who has ever lived who has met this standard in his own self, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he was a man of perfectly clean hands and pure heart. Only his righteousness measures up to the standard which God has set. We cannot meet those requirements. If we're going to be fit for the king, we need the king to give us the robes of righteousness to wear in his presence, don't we? You know, it's been suggested that in order to understand verses 4 and 5, it's helpful to take the phrases in reverse order. In other words, although it's true we must approach God cleanly and purely to find salvation, these characteristics are provided for us by God as a result of our justification. That is, they're part of the blessing that verse 5, uh, verse five promises. So, so look at it backwards here, the end of verse 5. Righteousness comes from God our Savior. First part of verse 5, blessing is from the Lord. This results in verse 4, clean hands, a pure heart, a life which doesn't lift itself up to idols or swear falsely. We cannot stand before God. We cannot stand in his holy place on our own merit. It's impossible. So are these blessings beyond our reach because we are sinners? Thankfully, the answer is no. Because God himself provides for us in Christ a righteousness that is not our own. You know, in Psalm 65, it says, Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions. You forgive them. In other words, God has provided a way of salvation for his people. There, there's no other way to approach God apart from the qualifications and his provision that he has given us. We can have hope. Not in ourselves, but in our God. God provides a way for us to enter into his presence. Verse 6 concludes the, the first portion of this psalm where it says, This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. You know, that reference to Jacob there at the end of verse 6 is a difficult one. But it seems to be a reminder of God's uh, hesed, his, his loving kindness, his loyal love that refuses to give up on his promise, even to a fast-talking, shifty-eyed, self-serving person like Jacob. You know his story. He was a trickster. He manipulated his brother to give up his firstborn rights. Uh, Jacob, the liar who deceived his father to seize Esau's blessing. And here it says Jacob is seeking God's face. He is... One who seeks, 
How can Jacob be the model for us of one who seeks God and enters God's presence? Because we're all sinners just as Jacob was. And if Jacob can receive a blessing and righteousness from God so that he can stand in God's holiness, so can we. If there was salvation for Jacob, there can be salvation for you and I. The psalm at this point gives the word selah, which isn't really exactly known what it stands for, but it's probably some sort of musical interlude at this point, giving people a time of, uh, of reflection, a time to stop and consider what's just been said. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? How can anyone enter God's presence and worship him? Who is able to stand in his holy place? Who has this salvation and righteousness from God? You know, those are the questions we must ask, we must find answers to. And in verse 7, we come to learn the answer to David's question from verse 3, that who may ascend the hill, who may stand? Who has a clean hands? Who has a pure heart? Who hasn't lifted up his soul towards what is false? Who has always spoken the truth of God? And so we come to the closing four verses, seven through ten, and, and, and it's thought this psalm was probably sung by those coming into Jerusalem as they brought the Ark of the Covenant. As they ascended the hill of the Lord, they would sing out, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And those in the city or on the walls would respond, Who is the king of glory? They would answer, The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Now think of those words. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is a warrior. Isaiah expressed similar themes when he announces in Isaiah 40. He says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. You know, in David's time, probably referring to the carrying of the ark into Jerusalem, the ark representing the king of glory, God's presence. It was a call to bring the ark into the sanctuary in a triumphant procession. Jump ahead a thousand years during Jesus' time here on the earth, the, the greater son of David. Picture him ascending the hill on Palm Sunday, coming into Jerusalem. Extend out to sometime in the future where Jesus ascends and reigns. He triumphs. Hints of this can be heard in Paul's exclamation, thanks be to God, why? who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Even the shout, lift up your heads, O gates, may cause us to think of Jesus himself. I mean, I mean the, the pictures of these worshipers ascending the mountain of the Lord, marching up to Jerusalem, is eclipsed by the coming of the Lord, who comes not only as King of kings and Lord of lords, but as friend of sinners offering them his perfect righteousness. This is the one who's called faithful and true, who, whose eyes are like blazing fire and who is wearing many crowns. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who is this King of glory? Jesus is the answer to that question. And this is too good to sing only once, right? And so they repeat it in verses 9 and 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Again, the request for entrance comes from those carrying the ark outside the city. Lift up your heads, O gates. For effect, it's repeated. Lift them up, O ancient doors. All this heralding occurs so the King of glory may come in. From within the city, who is this King of glory? The answer comes. The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? We know that. It's Jesus Christ. We read about it in God's declaration in Psalm chapter 2. 
where we read, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. The king of glory is Jesus, who entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in order to do what? To die for us a few days later. It's because he ascended to Jerusalem, entered in, and died there, that we can approach our holy God. We can ascend the hill. We can stand in his holy place. Jesus alone meets all the qualifications. Only he perfectly fulfilled the law in perfect righteousness. Only he can ascend the holy hill. Oh, he alone has clean hands, a pure heart from any hint of idolatry. He alone speaks only the truth. We're told in Isaiah, he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We know that, right? It's Jesus who went to the cross and became our salvation. He became our righteousness. It's he who enters the temple not made with hands, the heavenly temple, to make lasting atonement for our sins. It's his death, it's his resurrection that removes our guilt and shame. I mean, Paul exclaims that, that God has forgiven us in Christ, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against it, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it where? To the cross. Jesus is our salvation. He is our mediator. His righteousness alone is our provision. What does Paul tell us? God made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, so Jesus is the righteous one. He is the one that died for our sins. He is the one that gives us his righteousness when we are in him. It, only he can make us righteous. Only Jesus can cleanse our hands, purify our hearts. Only in Christ can we ascend the hill and stand in the holy place before our God. And however important and moving and transporting of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem by David may have been, it's not nearly as significant as when the true king of glory entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Uh, it's interesting, uh, rabbinical sources tell us that in Jewish worship, Psalm 24 was always used in worship on the first day of the week. That's our Sunday, right? If this is correct, we can assume that these words from Psalm 24 were being recited by the temple priests as Jesus mounted a donkey and ascended to Jerusalem. The people who were outside the walls, who were approaching Jerusalem with him, were crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And inside... The priests were saying, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. But as we know, the, the priests weren't joining in the cries of acclamation for Jesus, and within days they would conspire to have him executed as a, a blasphemer. As far as the people who were, uh, were concerned, even those that were hailing him as the Lord's anointed on Palm Sunday would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him later in the week. Jump ahead a week. Isn't it remarkable that this would be the psalm that would be sung in the temple on the morning of Jesus' resurrection? I mean, it's a, it's a fitting hymn of praise to sing every Sunday because it rejoices in our salvation, it's a declaration of our confidence in the return of our Lord as well. And so this morning, for those of you who think you can approach God, you can ascend his hill, you can stand on your own merit outside of Jesus, you are wrong. I beg of you, I plead with you to come to Jesus by faith. Because you will never, by your own works, by your own efforts, you will never meet the demands of God's perfect and holy law. It's impossible. Your only hope is to find a righteousness that is not your own. And Jesus Christ is that righteousness. In him, you can be forgiven of your sins. You can be cleansed. You can be given his righteousness. In him, you can stand before God and fear no condemnation. Jesus is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. 
And so if you're to stand before God and not be crushed and condemned by your own sin for eternity, you must have Jesus. It's his righteousness that needs to be credited to you by faith. And so it's my prayer that you'd see your need for Jesus today and for the righteousness that only he can give you. And that you would turn to him in faith, repentance from sin, find true life as God created you to have. And for those of you today who are trusting and resting in Jesus, my prayer for you is that you would stand fast in the gospel and continue trusting and resting in Jesus. Because it's the same, just as you came to Christ by the gospel in faith, trusting fully in him, so you walk and serve him every day from now on. And so we desire that God would work in us, produce in us clean hands, a pure heart, a steadfast soul, lips that don't lie. And he does this as he sanctifies us, as he conforms us more and more to the image of his son. You know, we're never justified by the work or the fruit of our, that we produce. No. Our standing before God is solely on the basis of Jesus and his work for us. Because of him, we don't have to pretend we're something we're not. We don't have to pretend we're better than we are. No. We don't have to pretend we don't struggle with sin. We do. If we say we have no sin, we do what? We make God a liar. We cut ourselves off from the gospel. We deny the very reason that Jesus came to die on the cross. Because of Jesus and what he has done, we can acknowledge, we can confess our sins knowing what? That God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So I encourage you, remember Jesus. Remember what he has done to bring you near to our sovereign, holy, and mighty God. He is the king of glory. Is he your king today? Father, we thank you once again for the salvation that you provide for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for this psalm that prophetically looked ahead to what Jesus would do. Father, it is our prayer that by faith in you, you would be conforming us to the image of our king. We thank you that even though we are sinners, even though we still sin, because of Jesus and what he has done for us, we have forgiveness. We can come into your presence. We can worship you. Father, we pray that if there are any here who do not know you through Jesus Christ, that today might be the day they might see that he is the king of glory, the only way to access a holy God. For those of us that are Christians, may we continue to look to Jesus and thank him for what he has done for us. May we continue to strive to have clean hands and pure hearts, mouths that are not deceitful. Father, may we seek to please you in what we do and what we think and what we say and how we interact with one another. May you be glorified. May you be honored in and through it. We thank you that you are the king and that we know that you are on your throne and you will reign continuously now and forevermore. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.